night and welcome back to our final night of our AA sessions. We have been tremendously blessed all week. We have learned how to overcome many addictions, of course, with the help of the Holy Spirit. I pray that as we listen to the presenter tonight, once again, our hearts will be blessed as we become winners in Christ. Welcome, everyone. Strong and keep my armor on. If I fall, rise the next time. Can't let them keep a good soldier down. See, I rise and take my place. Cause I'm more than a conqueror. I'm gonna finish this race. So call me a winner. journey called life. Thankful for where you brought me this far. With the strength I keep pushing on, on and on and higher I go. I'm not gonna give up. I'm gonna finish this race. So call me a winner. Our presenter for this evening is 
Sister Renisha Jones. She attends the Pineland Seventh-day Adventist Church, where she serves as the AY leader. She is also a lecturer in public health at the University of the West Indies, Cave Hill Campus. Sister Jones loves God and really wants those who have this struggle of body modification addiction to become a winner. Sister Jones, welcome to our meeting as you present, I pray that God will bless you abundantly. You are not hidden There's never been a moment You were forgotten You are not hopeless Though you have been broken Your innocence stolen I hear you whisper Underneath your Hi, good evening to everyone. Thank you for that warm welcome. I am happy to be here, grateful for the invitation. And so I'll invite us to just bow our heads before we get into this evening's session. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity where we can come together and learn more. And we ask that you would help this evening's session to be clear and where persons may need to overcome, we know that you have given them that victory already in Jesus Christ. And so we thank you for it in Jesus name, amen. All right, so today 
as was highlighted a few times um, in, the in the preliminaries, we're gonna be looking at the topic body modification. And so from my understanding, you would have been going through this week, looking at various types of addiction, you know, under this the theme, Call Me A Winner. And you're using one of my fave songs as your theme song by one of our very own. And so tonight, the chosen topic is body modification. And so just to take you through a little outline, we shouldn't, I hope, be here very long, but we are going to define body modification, explore various kinds of body modification, which if I remember the name, I think it was Kenesha that told us about some of the kinds of body modification a bit earlier. We look at some of the complications and consider body modification and when it may be referred to or considered to be an addiction. And then finally, we're gonna close off looking a bit at identity. And so what is body modification? And so hopefully you were listening when Kanisha shared earlier, um, there will be some places where I will seek your engagement. And so we'll start off very early with that. And I will ask someone to unmute and just tell us in your own words, what is body modification? What do you think about when you first hear the term? I'm patient, so I'll wait. <laughs> I'm patient in these circumstances when I ask for, <laughs> for a response. I have students, so I, I'm accustomed to waiting. Nobody has a guess as to what body modification is? Well, if not, I'm gonna share with you what it is. And later on, I'm letting you know in the early- Oh, I'm still with you, sure. Oh. So body, oh, body Jocelyn, my understanding, body modification is the changing or altering of your natural God-given appearance. Yeah, and that's a great definition. So the altering or the changing of your natural God-given appearance. So I like that one. And later in the session, which I was going to say, I'm going to be asking you for some Bible texts. And so muster up your courage to share some Bible texts nearer to the end. And so as our sister said, body modification, this is referring to any process that modifies the body from its natural state. It generally is used to describe piercings or tattoos, but certainly can extend to some other more extreme alternatives, which may include tongue splitting. Some people file their teeth to make them more pointed. You have surgically, surgically created elf ears, implanted devil-like horns, and the list goes on. But for the average person, you know, a tattoo or a two and an ear piercing are the limit. But this can vary from one person to another. Now, a little bit about the history of body modification. This is something that has been going on for quite some time, even though we can all appreciate that the interest in it has increased recently. But history teaches us that as far back as 2000 BC, you had use of tattoos, piercings, and scarification. And these were predominantly used as a form of art, art or in order to identify particular religious groups or tribes and so on. They were largely a sign of loyalty. It was a sign to others what your interests were, what your lifestyle choices were, and so on. And they were also used in that time period to label criminals, slaves, and convicts. But as we progress through time, late 20th century, we find that mostly men would have had tattoos. You had the 
stereotypical tattooed sailors, bikers. And then around, well, that was around in 1960s, you had the Hells Angels. And then 1980s, you had lots of gang members having tattoos. But now, present day, they are colorful ornamentations for both men and women. And everybody has likely met someone, knows someone personally who has a tattoo or any other kind of body modification. So we're gonna look at these kinds of body modification first. And as the outline showed, we'll look at those, then we'll consider what some of the complications are before we touch on the, the potential of it being an addictive practice. So scarification, this is the first one we'll consider. You're intentionally creating, well, it says it in the title, scars on your body. You can either use metal to, to make that little carving in the body, any sharp instrument really, and you're cutting into the skin or you're making an abrasion. And oftentimes you will see those in tribal markings and rites of pas passage. And if you look to the upper left corner, you will see some tribal markings on this individual's abdomen. And so that's what scarification was used for predominantly back in time, just, you know, to be a, a rite of passage. Nowadays, persons may use it for other things. We actually see this individual has a dove on, I don't know what part of the body, presumably the back, and the dove with Holy Spirit on it. And then we see this star here on this individual's back. And so persons use it for various <laughs> reasons. Then we have branding, which is a type of scarification. And in this case, you are burning a pattern into the skin, as you see on the left hand side. But there's some other methods besides burning. Some people actually use cold, so they would freeze um, their skin, which ultimately will still leave a scar because they're still damaging the tissues. And they would dip the metal into liquid nitrogen and then apply it to the skin. Piercings, everybody knows about piercings. And it's just an opening in the body for the purpose of inserting jewelry. And so we have up here at the very top, when I first saw this image, I wish I was certain it was a male, um, but it's actually a female. I don't know if any of you know of this Guinness World Record holder, but her name is Elaine Davidson. And she was named the most pierced woman in the world in a single count back in 2000, so May 2000. And then she was also named as the most pierced woman in a lifetime in 2003. And as of January 2019, she reportedly had over 11,000 piercings in total. Mm -hmm. And so these, we see it varies. Some people might just have two earlobes pierced. Some people might be like Miss Elaine Davidson, who has 11,000 total piercings. You also have tongue and navel piercings. We know about these. The left image, the piercer, if we may call them that, they're holding the tongue with a forceps, because I'm sure you would retract your tongue if someone was pushing a 12 gauge needle through it. And so they hold the tongue with a forceps, and then they use a hollow needle to bore a hole in the tongue. And as you see, this individual already has a tongue piercing, but she's getting another piercing here. Now, another strange one are corset piercings. So this is a style of multiple piercings. They're usually bilateral, so that means on both sides. And while the back is the most common place where they are done, persons sometimes also get them on their neck and other extremities. So you have the piercings bilaterally, they're parallel, and then you lace whatever material you want to, to give the appearance of a corset. Then we have earlobe stretching, or what we may call gauging, because these, this very big 
this is likely a plastic one. You can use plastic or wooden gauges. And so that's why it's also referred to as ear lobe gauging. And persons do this. They first have to pierce the ear, let it heal, and then they begin the stretching process by putting in increasing sizes of gauges over time in order to stretch the ear lobe. And then they use plastic or wooden pegs afterward to <laughs> fill the hole. <laughs> and then if we thought that that was far enough, they're also transdermal and subdermal implants. And what does this mean? So they're really just skin implants and you're placing a foreign object. And when it's transdermal, it means you're placing it just within the skin and a portion of it may, well, usually appears on the surface. So like this image right here in this smaller circle, those are transdermal because you can actually see part of the foreign object outside of the skin. So they would place a part of the object known as the base or the step or the anchor under the skin. And it has um, something that you can screw it on. So I guess they're really putting a screw underneath so that you can screw on the little fixtures on top that would be visible. And then you have the subdermal implants, which are completely seated under the skin. So for this individual, they have the subdermal implants where their eyebrows are supposed to be. And persons tend to do this when they want to get a 3D look. So they want this three-dimensional look. Now, there are just about three more, I think, that we'll, we'll mention. There's tongue splitting which is also referred to as forking the tongue. And it involves having that midline incision in the tongue. You can use a sharp scalpel. You might use a laser to perform this tongue splitting. You have tattooing, which we all know about. And there are some cells in our body that usually when there's something foreign in the body, they try to eat them up, to put it simply. And they're referred to as macrophages. And these eat up the ink, and that is what actually maintains the color within the skin, right? And so sterile needles are usually supposed to be used. The skin is clean with alcohol and iodine, and then the ink is applied. And finally, we have a brow lift, and we know there are many other modifications if we were to speak to plastic surgery and all of the things that can be um, under that heading of plastic surgery. You know that there are people who get liposuction. You don't go as far as liposuction, but then you also want to move the fat. You want to translocate it from your abdomen to your hips. And there's all sorts of things going on. And a study was conducted back in 2008 um, among undergraduate students in the US and the average age of the participants was 21 years. And here are just some statistics. There is a little more recent article I'll reference a little later down, but there aren't very many that speak to this idea of body modification being an addiction. But in this um, survey and this paper titled Lifestyle Risks, looking at tattoos and body piercings, 42% of men and 60% of women had body piercings. And in this survey, because they knew that piercing of the earlobes in women was quite common, those were excluded. And so outside of having a female with her ears pierced, 42% of men and 60% of women had body piercings. And there were, was a maximum of five piercings. 31% of men had pierced ears, 2% tongue, eyebrow, nipple, genitals, and navel. And 29% of women have pierced navels, 27% had pierced ears, 12 pierced tongue, five pierced nipple, approximately 2% pierced genitals, nose, or lip. And this same study reported that 86%, that's supposed to be never regretted, right? 86% said that they never regretted getting whatever kind of body modification 
uh, 30% said it made them feel sexier, 25% felt rebellious, 21% felt attractive or strong, 16% felt spiritual, 9% felt healthier, 8% felt more intelligent, and 5% felt athletic. So very interesting findings. Now, to have a quick look at some of the complications, and I'm pretty sure some of you know, know some of them, some of them are quite obvious, and we're not going in deep detail, but it's just to give you a rounded picture of what body modification is all about, and what are some of the reasons you may want to avoid it. Now, complications of piercings, of course, we can immediately think of having infection, Localized infection just means that you have an infection where the piercing was done at the site. You can also have an allergic reaction to the piercing or the jewelry that is placed in the ear more, most commonly. And so in the top left image, you will see here an ear that looks like it is very crusty on the outside. That's because this individual had what we refer to as a contact dermatitis. It just means you have irritation of the skin because something is touching it and irritating it. And in addition to that contact dermatitis, she also had a superimposed bacterial infection. So she had the allergic reaction, but then on top of that, it got infected with a bacteria. And that's why it looks like that. So that's one side effect. Of course, we know swelling pain could be common. Some people who are prone may get skin discoloration and keloid formation. This is not extremely common, but it certainly can happen in any individual when you get a cut anywhere. And so a piercing, as it would be some kind of incision in the skin, can result in keloid formation as well. And this can occur, affect anyone. It usually affects persons younger than age 30, right? So between 10 and 30, they're more likely to develop them. And it's thought it might have a genetic, genetic predisposition, but it's not quite certain. Now, what about these subdermal implants? Does it make sense trying to get them? Who, who says that you won't get one of these complications? Now, implant rejection makes sense. You're putting an entirely foreign thing under your skin it's bound to be rejected and the body try to attack it. You can get infection, you can get skin ulceration. So you have this foreign body that's constantly causing friction and rubbing up against the skin. Certainly then an ulcer can form. You can have nerve or muscle damage, allergic reactions, chronic pain. In terms of branding, this individual has multiple ulcers. So the tissue around it is dead. Right, so all of these, they were branded with a, um, a cylindrical rod, a metal rod, and they develop ulcers. And below here is actually an abscess, right? And so it has the little yellow crusting and the abscess would tend to, you know, having bacteria or what's not. So you can have allergic reactions. You can get the same keloids. Some people can get skin cancer after branding or scarification. And certainly you can have disfigurement. And finally, we'll be looking at the oral piercings and the tongue splitting, followed by uh, the tattooing. Complications, quite similar. So I'm not gonna talk much about the ones we've mentioned before, but other complications can arise if you have piercings in the mouth. So of course it can damage the teeth, right? If you have it in the tongue, you can have excessive bleeding if the individual that's doing the procedure, you know, punctures a blood vessel. The tongue is full of blood vessels and nerve endings. And so you can get nerve damage as well, which can result in difficulty swallowing, speaking and chewing. And you can have other issues like your gums might recede. You know, the body just starts to rebel against these piercings in the mouth for some individuals. For others who have this tongue splitting, similarly, as we mentioned with the oral piercings, they can have issues with the nerves, they can have 
hemorrhage, depending on if the individual cuts a blood vessel and tongue swelling could occur and result in obstruction of the airway. And so tattooing, many of the similar complications, but just bringing it up so that we can mention each of them. Now this individual here, he is 23 years old and this infection of the skin is likely because the instruments were not properly sterilized or because the ink was contaminated. And certainly your risk greatly increases when the procedure doesn't follow the regulated guidelines. And so obviously we can see the complications of ear stretching. You're left with a massive hole in your ear <laughs> that you can't do anything with. Usually if it's more than a half inch, it's not gonna heal on its own. And sometimes you can get surgery to try to fix it. But I'm thinking in this instance, prevention is better than cure. And now if we look again at the study, after looking at those complications, 17% of the individuals in that study had experienced complications. And the most common for them were bacterial infections, bleeding, and local trauma. They didn't have any cases of spread of viruses because we know in these instances, you can be spreading hepatitis B or C, HIV, and so on. And some of them had oral and dental injury because of tongue piercings. But interestingly, when this was investigated again, adolescents and young adult tattooing and piercing and so on, in 2017, adolescents were unaware of complications. So 38%, we're gonna say the percentage that knew about complications. And you'll see from looking at these numbers that more than half did not have any clue about the complications because 38% knew about possible infection with hep C, 34% about hep B, 34% about tetanus, and 28% knew about other non-infectious complications, which we spoke about in terms of just having like, you know, the air hole is now stretched to capacity and it can't be fit and so on. Or the contact dermatitis, which doesn't necessarily need to become infected. They had no clue about these things. But somehow or the other would have been influenced to get body piercings. And so it causes us to ask the question, is it some form of addiction? Should we now talk about body mod addiction as opposed to body modifications? Are people becoming addicted to this? And what are some of the motivations behind body modification. And in considering these motivations, we will be able to determine whether or not participation in these activities would constitute an addiction or not. Now this next image, this individual was referred to as the stalking cat. I don't know if anybody knew about this stalking cat before tonight. Um, his name is Dennis Anver, and he sadly committed suicide in November of 2012. And it is very likely that he had a mental instability that would have led to these severe modifications. So the tattooing of the face, the filing of the teeth so that they would look like a cat teeth. Maybe he's a tiger. He had his entire extremities tattooed. He had very long nails, which you can't see in this image. He also had piercings all on the upper lip and certainly some plastic surgery to, you know, get his cheeks filled out, his lips were altered and so on. And so for some individuals, why I put this here, it is not that they have an addiction per se, if you want, if you use that term loosely, but they actually have other psychological disorders or mental disorders. And so most body modification enthusiasts do not have mental disorders. A very small percentage who seek them would have um, mental disorders. And in this case, this disorder 
is similar to what was being described in the health feature beyond just low self-esteem or um, a poor body image, there is a disorder referred to as body dysmorphic disorder. And so when you have body dysmorphia, as you can see from this image, you have a, a slim lady here, but when she looks into the mirror, she sees herself as being morbidly obese. And so body dysmorphic disorder, just so that I could put in this caveat so that we know some people actually have a psychological disorder beyond just saying that they're addicted to this thing. And it's where you, you see flaws. Flaws appear in the mirror that can't be seen by others, right? And you may feel very embarrassed. And as a result of that, you then start seeking out numerous cosmetic procedures to try and fix whatever perceived flaw. Some of the very common ones are, you know, people don't like their nose, some other things about their face, uh, their body shape, and so on. And so this is a psychological disorder. You have to be treated with behavioral therapy and medications and so on to disrupt these thought processes that you have. And in men, sometimes they can have what is referred to as a muscle dysmorphia. And so they will see themselves and think that they're too small, they're not mu muscular enough. And that's very common in males if they have this disorder. And then there's also the gender dysphoria where people have this thought process that they weren't meant to be a certain sex and they have this psychological gender dysphoria and they may go and try to seek cosmetic um, enhancements in order to try to fit into that dysphoric state that they are in. And so there are some legitimate medical disorders that may cause people to undertake body modifications. But outside of that, here are some modification, motivations rather, that have been given by persons for body modification. And outside of this list, some people were like, no specific reason. But these are some of the motivations persons have given. And you will see the second to last one is addiction, which we will focus on for a short period. So you have motivations for beauty, art, and fashion. Persons do it for individuality just to have their personal narrative. So this is a story they're telling about themselves and their life through these body modifications. Some people's motive is to test out their physical endurance. Some it's to be uh, showing their affiliation or commitment to some particular group. Others it's to put up a resistance. It's to show some kind of rebellion against something or the other. Others, even to this day, it may be done for spiritual reasons or cultural traditions. Then we have addiction as a motivation and then also sexual motivations. And so our focus in the latter half here will be on addiction. And if addiction is present, what are some of the signs that you would expect to see? And what is some advice in terms of breaking free or overcoming the particular addiction. And just to be clear, any pleasurable activity, whether it's shopping, gambling, sex, can be addictive and includes tattoos and any other body modification. They don't necessarily require an external chemical because when we talk about addiction, and I think you guys would have proven that throughout this week because you didn't speak only to things like, oh, alcohol addiction, cocaine, heroin, and so on. So it has been laid out this week that you don't necessarily require an external chemical in order to form an addiction, but you can form an addiction through a process. So you can have a process addiction. And when we speak about process addiction, we're talking about a behavioral addiction. And you looked at a lot of them uh, this week. So this is a compulsive indulgence in a specific behavior or types of behaviors that have the net result of harm to the person. 
plus, so it's not only that, plus the inability of the person to moderate or manage the behaviors without treatment. And so if we're going to classify something as an addiction, certain criteria have to be met. And that includes harm to the individual, as well as them being unable to moderate or manage whatever the behavior is without treatment, whether the treatment is cognitive behavioral, behavioral therapy. So you're going to sit down and you talk with a psychiatrist who tries to help you to change your views about yourself and views about the world and so on, and to replace them with positive and more logical thoughts, or whether it's medicine, if you can't overcome it without those things, then that's one of the criteria that helps us to classify it as being an addiction. And so individuals may report a number of behaviors that they compulsively engaging to contribute to their inability to move forward or focus on other parts of their lives. And another key point is coming out there, the ability to focus on other key elements in your life. And so we'll have a slide after this that lists them as points, but I'm just gonna say a couple of them right now. So you have people, it becomes a ritual, is something they have to do. They have to indulge in some destructive behavior. And it's a behavioral process. And so I'm going to use a common addiction, let's say to heroin, to establish what the behavioral side of it is. So it's not just shooting up with the heroin. They are addicted to the process. There's this nostalgic feeling about the process of cooking it up, loading the needle, tying off the arm or what's not, that contributes and comes before the actual high. And so some people who are addicted to that are actually addicted to the process and not only the external drug. And so similarly, with the body modification, it could be that persons are addicted to that process, right? They like going to the tattoo parlor, they like to feel the pricks of the needle and they're having some kind of endorphin release as this is going on and the pleasure centers, the dopamine is released and what's not. And so they just love going to the tattoo parlor because it's gonna make them feel great. After it, they're going to feel, uh, what did some of the people say in the survey? Sexier, more attractive more intelligent apparently and all those all those different things and so they might experience that rush during the mod body modification process which then creates just like it would any other drug creates a strong desire for further piercings or tattoos and while that is an addiction we keep in mind some individuals may have co-occurring mental disorders like the ones we mentioned before. Now the top behavioral or process addictions include some of what you covered this week, pornography, internet addiction, social media addiction. I think you cover that in under technology. Yes, you have sex addiction, gambling addiction, shopping addictions. And interestingly, the literature is not fully settled on um, body modification being definitively an addiction because many persons with multiple tattoos live their lives without these issues that we will mention on this next slide. Now, these are the signs of addiction to body modification. And again, it would only be considered an addiction if it fits these criteria. So we have varying psychological um, associations and so on that define addiction because addiction is a mental disorder as well. And so signs that it's an addiction would be accelerated modification patterns, financial problems from spending on increased modifications. And usually when we have criteria like this, they will say that you need to have a certain number out of the total in order for it to be classified as the disorder. 
but this isn't listed in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Psychi Psychiatric Disorders. And so I can't tell you how many criteria you need out of this list, but all I can tell you is that these are some of the signs. The third one, having tattoos in inappropriate locations. For example, you want a job, where are you going to tattoo your face? More than likely, persons aren't going to want to hire you with a tattoo on your face, right? And sometimes we may think about having those sleeves. And I want to show you an individual in the next slide, though, that goes about her life quite well and does things at very high levels, including Congress, and she's fully tatted all down her arms. But another one, the fourth one, extreme proliferation of body modification. So probably like Elaine Davidson, because you have 11,000 piercings. But then again, if they're also saying that you must be having financial problems because you're increasing spending, you are consistently talking and thinking about it, perhaps if she wasn't doing those things, she would not be classified as having an addiction. But we have missing work or obligations due to getting tattoos or piercings or allowing your work to suffer due to planning or daydreaming about new modifications. And so these are the signs of addiction. And so it's emphasized in the literature that having many body modifications does not necessarily mean that you are addicted. However, in these scenarios, with the presentation of these characteristics and so on, it is likely that you are addicted to body modification. And this is based on studies of other addictions, which would have clued us in as to the signs that occur in individuals that are addicted to other drugs, other things, and so on. Now, here on this slide, we have Hannah Shaw. She's also known as the kitten lady. And she's one example of an individual with many tattoos who is classified as being quote unquote normal because she has managed to be heavily tattooed and lives a normal life. And her body modification does not play a dominating role. She also was able to present important work with respect to her kitten because she's a neonatal kitten rescuer and animal advocate. And she spoke in front of Congress, defending legislation to stop animal testing and so on. And so she is an example that is used to hammer home the point that not just because you have many or that having many doesn't necessarily mean that you are ill or have an addiction. Now, what I found interesting that I left for last outside of addiction and so on, is that body modifications are often associated with self-discovery and identity. And so while the medical literature may not have caught up to say body modification in its extent, you know, having multiple ones is an addiction, they are saying that they are associated with self-discovery and identity. And I thought that was key because even though we might not be able to establish today that everybody with multiple body modifications have an addiction, we can identify and say with certainty that a lot of these individuals um, participate in these modifications in order to find themselves, in order to establish their identity. And where you find your identity matters. What, where, in who you find your identity, it matters. Because I heard someone said sometime back that whatever you find your identity in, whatever you find your value in, you are only as good as it's going. And so if you find your identity, for example, in people's approval, this is an easy example, then when you're not receiving those affirmations, you start to feel worthless, you feel the need to then pursue those affirmations, which may lead to risky behavior. So you need people to tell you that you're pretty, you need to fit in. So you need to get pierced, you need to get tatted, you need to get this scarification because everybody in your group does it. And so 
This whole concept of identity and self-discovery is very important, especially for us who would describe ourselves as Christians, as followers of Christ. And so it would be advisable, as opposed to finding your identity in something that is transient, something that, yeah, you know, here today, gone tomorrow, tattoos that when you get older and it starts to sag, you feel bad about yourself because now the tattoos look bad. And so now your identity is destroyed when you hit some older age and they're fading out. And you know, as we would say, this looks swibbly. <laughs> you need to find your identity in something else. And so it would be advisable to, in overcoming these quote unquote addictions, I'll still call them that even though the literature gives us all those other characteristics that must be associated. But in order to overcome these addictions to body modification, and understanding that self-discovery and identity lie at their basis, we certainly have to place our identity or find our identity in something or someone that is a guarantee. And so obviously we know where I'm going. We have to find our identity in Christ. From the time we go about self-discovery, trying to answer questions of who am I? What's my purpose in life? which tends to happen. You're going through the adolescent phase and you, you for the life of you, you can't understand why, why it is that you was born onto this earth and you're trying to figure out what it is that you're meant to do, whether it's the in career path, if you are ever going to, I don't know, be married, have children and what's not. And you're trying to find your identity in all of those things. And this who I am, who am I path, if you undertake it alone, is really a path to discontent. And I'm sure some of you might agree, as self will never necessarily be perfect. And you always find something that isn't quite right, something that could probably be fixed up with a little nip and tuck here and there, something that will make you feel more beautiful. Some people, they just can't leave home without a pair of earrings because they think they look naked and they look bad without earrings. And so looking for who I, who I am outside of Christ is a path to discontent because you will always find something that's not good enough that may need some kind of modification. And now that is not to say that persons with body modifications do not have identity in Christ because that's not my determination to me. Scripture counsels us in 1 Corinthians 4 not to judge anything before the time until the Lord comes. And so that's not our purpose here. But what we are saying is that where you find yourself and where you find your identity will show in how you live out your life. And here is where I want some more of your participation as we're winding to an end. I want you to look for some Bible texts that tell us about our identity. And as you find those texts, I want you to say, what about your identity the text speaks to and maybe we'll just get two persons to give us a bible text that speaks to your identity in christ and then we're going to try to link that all back to what we would have discussed in terms of body modifications and addictions and how finding and seeing ourselves as christ sees us can help and so the floor is open for anyone who has a text that comes to mind with respect to our identity in Christ. So just two persons. Think about a text. Even if you can't find it immediately and you just have the gist of the text, you can share that with us. <laughs> Um, there's the text that says you're fearfully and wonderfully made. Yes, that's a love. <laughs> Sorry, I want to apologize for my puppy. Somebody knocked on the door. And so 
it's her territory, so she is trying to show them who is boss. Hopefully the noise does not persist. <laughs> the individual realizes that I cannot come to the door and the puppy stops barking. But yes, that is a lovely one that we're fearfully and wonderfully made. Does one more person have a text that they can share with respect to our identity in Christ? Galatians 2.20. Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live. Christ, but Christ lives in me. But Christ lives in me. But yes. I no live in the body. I live with faith in the Son of God. In the Son of God. That's another amazing one. <laughs> And so I have an, a, a slide that looks at some more texts that help us to know who we are. Now, <laughs> I want you, you can remain muted. I like these affirmations where we establish who we are in Christ. And there are way too many people on here. If I have, usually if I have a very small group, I let everybody repeat one so that you are saying it about you. And then we'll figure out how this links back to overcoming addictions. So feel free to keep muted, but stay with me. We're gonna just read all the things on the left-hand side that tell us who we are and the reference text is noted underneath. So we'll say together, I am God's child. I am a friend of Christ. I am a member of Christ's church. I am a citizen of heaven. I am God's workmanship. I am a new creation. I am a minister of God. I am justified and righteous. I am secure in his hand. I am free from condemnation. And so I want to encourage you this evening, having looked at body modification, all of the motivations that people have for it and how it can become an addiction and the fact that its underlying basis is in trying to establish identity and self-discovery, I want to encourage you to find your true identity. Now, Christian selfhood, finding yourself when you're a Christian, is not defined in terms of, you know, who we are in and of ourselves. It's defined in terms of what God does for us, what he does to us, and the relationship he has with us, and the destiny he appoints for us. Now, God made us who we are, right, so that he could make known to us who he is. And our identity is for the sake of making known his identity, because we know that when Jesus Christ comes again, we will see him as he is, because we will be like him. And so Christ's purpose here on this earth is not for us to look like all the celebrities or to look like the persons who we may be inclined to find our identity in, but it's for us to look like him. And this identity is a gift from God. And we find our belonging in Jesus and we are united to Jesus. And so that motivation of being a part of a group and identifying yourself and your loyalties and so on, doesn't need to happen for the Christian who finds their true identity in Christ. That's not something that they're seeking after. Our identity in Christ is found when we realize how God sees us and what God says about us. And we'll just consider three things that God says about us by using Bible text. Christ tells us that we are forgiven. Regardless of what we have done in our lives, all can soak in the forgiveness that Christ offers. Some people, they walk around with guilt and shame. They decide not to be a part of the Christian religion or a part of their church anymore because they don't feel they're forgiven and they don't know that Christ has forgiven them. But the word tells us that God so loved the world. That's how we know it. But I'm reading from the New Living Translation which says, for this is how God loved the world. 
he gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Keyword, everyone. He did it so that everyone can have this eternal life. And so sometimes we try to attach our identity to various things, people, body modifications, with disappointing results. But God's forgiveness is all-encompassing and he accepts us. And he doesn't evaluate us to see what we're looking like, you know, because he paid the price for us. And he is there waiting, ready, and willing to accept us and forgive us. Secondly, we are loved. Psalm 36, 5 says, Your unfailing love, O Lord, is as vast as the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches beyond the clouds. Sometimes it can be difficult for us to believe in God's unconditional love for us when it is compared to the conditional love that is so frequently offered. And sometimes that's why we get into these modifications. And a lot of the times when they're tied to emotions, that's when people tend to, you know, go and get multiple modifications. But if we stand in the fact and the knowledge that we are loved by God, and his love is recorded throughout scripture. And once we are able to dwell in that, see it demonstrated in our lives, then we will not be out and about searching for love in all the wrong places. Thirdly, we are called. Isaiah 43, 1, which can be applied to us, says, Fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. And so we are assured that God knows us and that he has called us. And the rewards that he has for us, they are unending and they don't only bring temporary satisfaction. And that's why people have to go back and go back and go back because you get the high, you drop down and now you need it again. But with God, the satisfaction is a deep soul satisfaction that is long lasting and the world didn't give it. So guess what? The world can't take it away, right? And so I want to encourage you, instead of going through the fact that you can have behavioral therapy and talk to a psychologist, which is, which is all well and good, aside from going through the fact that you can get medications if it's an obsessive disorder and you need to get some kind of medical treatment, instead of going through that, I thought we would look at finding our identity in Christ because that is usually the basis for us trying to find our identity and our worth in other things. And so given this identity in Christ, I want to remind you that anyone who is in him is a new creation. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. And so any upgrade that you think you need, and for context, I'm going to make reference to some of those things that people said before. So any upgrade you think you need to feel sexier, attractive, strong, spiritual, more intelligent, those upgrades can be found in Christ. I encourage you to see you as God sees you and to remember that in him, we have everything that we need. Second Peter 1 Peter 1.3 says that his divine power has given us everything. Ephesians 1.3 tells us that we have in Christ every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. And I'm telling you, when you realize this, when you understand this for yourself, you will find such joy in the fact that God has called you his child. God has given you everything that Jesus has. You will not have that urge to fulfill those desires outside of him. You will have that certainty and you will be filled not with those transient things that up, down, up, down, up, down, but you'll be filled with the eternal certainty that is found in Christ. And so I thank you for your attention and encourage you in the Lord and encourage you to find your identity in him.